Hi everybody, welcome to Talking Automotive with Mark and John. My name is John Sinclair and my co-host Mark Palavestra. Hi John, today we've got Philip Mance. Uh, Philip Mance is from the Ellen Mance Motor Group. Philip is the managing director of the group. Uh, he has a number of OEM franchise dealerships across the western part of uh, Melbourne and into country Victoria. Uh, so a very influential and successful uh, dealer principal in the auto business. Here's Mark, a very experienced operator, and he gets into some real detail how to manage a dealership. And I think that brings a lot of value across. So it's a really a great listen, and I think people are gonna enjoy what, what they hear today. Let's get into the show. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services is an independent division of Precar Services, offering specialty fleet fit-outs for commercial applications ranging from simple tray and tow bar fitments to fully bespoke service body and accessory installation. With quality assured safety, compliance and standardisation of vehicle builds, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. For further information on how Precar Fleet Services can assist in solving your commercial vehicle fit-out needs, please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Well, welcome to today's podcast. Today, we've got a very special guest speaker. We have Philip Mance, the Managing Director from the Alan Mance Motor Group. Welcome, Philip. Good morning. Yeah, Philip, uh, from our side, thanks very much for joining us. It's a great honor to have you on the show. Maybe just to kick off for the first question, just from a big picture point of view, understanding of what are the big challenges facing dealers at the moment and how do you see that going into the future? Oh, look, the biggest challenge, well, obviously in the current environment, it's a challenge in Melbourne because we're in stage four lockdown. So, you know, we've had to really change the way that we sell cars because people can't come in. Now that's different to each state, but everyone has restrictions on um, how they, you know, contact people, test drives and so on. So really moved to more of a, you know, digital video, live, st live stream, live chat type of situation for us, even to the point putting the car on the hoist, taking a video of underneath it, because everyone can see around the car, but they can't see the underneath of it. So, you know, for a couple of times people have asked, can we have a look at the underneath? So yeah, we get up, put on a hoist and take a video of the underneath. So, you know, if anything, you probably, they're getting the car checked out more than if they were here physically looking at it. But a few people lie on the ground and look underneath it. But, you know, it's really a matter of, you know, adapting to the, the situation, which really is just trying to look outside the box as much as possible. And as far as outside of the COVID side of it, uh, the industry in Australia has been going through a lot of change for 29 months of negative growth or decline in the industry. What big, uh, notwithstanding the COVID situation, but what are, were the challenges that you saw happening already over the last two years? And, and what, where do you see that going forward? Well, the biggest one's probably the finance one, the changes to the federal government in the Credit Act. And that really affected the fact that a lot of people can't get finance. And that uh, has affected the car sales. So it's a good good thing in one hand great that you know the customers being more looked after you know and that's debatable in terms of how much they were being looked after certainly people are taking advantage of people so there's no issue with that and that's been proven with the banks and so on but on the other hand a person who is on a lower economic ratio of person who's you know struggling but needs a car can't get a loan so he then has to drive an older car that breaks down more, that has worse emissions and so on and so forth. And so in the end, he can never get, you know, work his way up as he used to. He would get a car. He may have had to pay slightly more higher interest than me, but he was happy to do that because he got better fuel economy. It was more reliable. All the things that go with the newer car. Well, now he can't buy one. So he has to buy and drive around in an unroadworthy, older car with all the associated problems with it. So... And that's one of the main reasons why the new car sales have dropped is because a lot of people can't get finance. So only you're basically put in three buckets, gold, silver, and bronze. Now, 
in the if you're a bronze, you're actually on a worse deal than you were pre the Credit Act. So if you're a bronze person pre the credit, your interest rate was lower than what it is now because the banks put you in, you're the worst bracket of person. But then the people are nice, just the fact that you might have three children, uh, you're a renter and all those sorts of things. So you've been put in a very low bracket. So you pay the maximum interest, which in actual fact is worse than what it was. So what actions are able to be taken to assist that person or is it pretty much just cut and dry, they're now shut out of the market? Yeah, yeah, there's nothing you can do. And then they have to go and get a personal loan. So they're paying more interest or refinance their house, which at the moment you can't do because a lot of these people, if they go to refinance their house, have to go through the same process as if they were taking out a new loan. And if they were going to get a new loan, they wouldn't have got the loan they've currently got because they don't meet the criteria now. So then they can't extend their house mortgage to buy another car because they don't meet the criteria. So the bank goes, well, no, no, I can't give you any money. Technically, if you'd applied for your bank loan now, you wouldn't have got it anyway. So you'd be renting. Yeah, so it's quite a difficult situation for Absolutely. For customers. Yeah. Yeah, that's developing, has developed a bit better over the period. They've had a few breaks and the government have changed a few of the rules. But it is still quite stringent for that bracket of people. Uh, and that has really affected car sales in terms of, that's why the used car market is very strong still because they can't, they can't buy a new car. So they still are looking for a lower priced, cheaper used car. So Philip, following on from that, how do you attract and retain customers? What are the main actions you need to do as a dealership? Look, everything is, is based around digital. When I first started, you used to get the age every week and it, it was two inches thick. An inch of it was cars and you would be looking at the ads every week and the paper. If you can remember back that far, Mark, you know, that what, what it was like 30 years ago, and I'm sure it was the same in South Africa, John, that, you know, it was all based around the paper every week and the Herald Sun was 40 pages. Well, the Herald Sun's four pages. There isn't a car's guide in the age. A couple of pages, it might be a page if that's it. So it's all based around a digital thing. And now with Facebook and Instagram, you can target your own customers. There's a myriad of ways of doing it. And it's a lot more personal. It's very accurate. Pick segments in the market, age brackets, people that have come to see you, you can retarget to them. So for me, it's been quite good. Which one's more effective do you find? Facebook, Instagram, or do you use Twitter or now there's other platforms? Oh, Twitter's like the uh, cesspool of social media. I wouldn't go on Twitter if you paid me to go on Twitter. That's what everyone says about Twitter. If you want to bucket someone, Twitter's where it's at. So now I, I use Facebook. Instagram for me is more of a um, food, lifestyle, vegans, hamburgers, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I can't really see it, not really as much as a great place for cars. I do see the occasional ad on there, but it's not what I go on there for. And I talk to a lot of people and it's not really that sort of demographic or what people are looking for on, on Instagram. It's um, more about clothes, makeup, Instagram um, influences, those sorts of people. For me, it's, you know, might be travel, food, that sort of thing. For other people, it's more about hobbies and um, art and that sort of stuff. But it, yeah, no, for cars, it's doesn't, it's not cutting my crumpet on that bit, no. And as far as the uh, online portals for used cars and new cars, like the car sales of the world, do you, yeah. you, you're pretty active in, in those areas as well? No, well, you have to be. You know, if you're not on there, you're not a car dealer, basically. You have to be on it. What you're trying to do, basically, your whole, my whole world is trying to get people off car sales and to my website to look at my cars on my website. So, because they're free, the leads are free. I'm doing it that way. Whereas car sales, I think it's, you know, well, at the moment it's free, which is nice. Uh, but, at the, you know, normally it's 50 or $55 per lead. So it gets pretty hexy. As far as funnel, funneling people to your website, the, the Alan Mance brand is a very strong brand. I remember early days uh, sitting in your office and you're talking about this new thing called the internet. I think it was 98 or 99. And you said, just watch this, Mark. It's, it's, but you said... 98, like, not 98. All right, it, 89. It's, it's like, a, like, like an anaconda that can come up and just bite you. But he said, you, I remember you saying how amazing it's going to be. So you're one of the very early adopters when it comes to playing in the digital space and building the brand of the Alan Mans brand. How do you develop and maintain that brand? digitally and also all the other, with all the other stuff that you do. Oh, well, you know, you've got to do it every day. Over that period, I can remember starting with Google when it started. I tell my children that they think I'm from outer space, looking at the background of me. <laughs> you know, they just they don't comprehend. Well, what did you do before then? 
can't actually remember what we used to do before Google, to be honest. I think there was uh, something. I can't think of what it was. We had books, magazines that we used to look at. No, look, it's a constant, you know, you're developing it the whole time. You know, I sit here trying to reinvent brand, how we do it, how people contact us, you know, every day. You know, changing something, tweaking something here, doing something there. You're always trying to um, evolve with it because Google changes all the time. You know, there's I could look on my account and then all of a sudden there'll be something come up. Oh, there's a new thing that's just come out uh, on how to search, how people search, how to find people. So then I have to go and read it all. And I've got another full-time bloke that um, I work with here who uh, works full-time that it is doing okay what is that find out about it let's have a chat about it how can we use it and then give it a crack yeah so you're always trying to look at different aspects of whether it be online or internally the, the whole box and dice you're always trying to have the touch points as many touch points as you can with the customer whether it be in service parts big online parts store which is uh, very popular but it's taken you know three four five years to get to that the point now where it's like in these particular times on the weekend, it's going off. Like it's, we're going crazy. It's just we've got boxes and boxes of stuff going out. Philip, in terms of, are there any other marketing, particular marketing activities that you do to drive your brand and develop your brand? Well, the main's pretty much too, Facebook and Google. We do a bit on Instagram because when you do a Facebook ad, it actually connects to Instagram. So it'll, it'll, it'll do it up on Instagram, but yeah. So they're the main three that we use. Yeah. And I do still do a bit of local paper, uh, but in certain areas, uh, Bacchus Marsh, there's a local paper ad going in next week for a service. But you know, in terms of trying to sell cars like you used to in the local paper, uh, I think it's a dying art. And shopping center displays and those type of activities. Yeah, do I think you, they're good. Do you do some of that? Um, yeah, we did that. We, we did High Point. I hired a shop for three months that was on a short, short term rental. The biggest issue, you've got to be there the whole, you have to be open when they're open and close when they shut. So yeah. you know, if you're, if it's Saturday, Sunday till 9 p.m., if they open at nine, you've got to be there. Like it, it's a lot of work. I don't know if I could do it in one brand. I change the brands every month, so different people, but shopping centers, they reckon the return is like 85 percent of people go there every week so if you had the same brand there well they'd look at it once and you know the same people would go there so i think it, it varies and then monday tuesday wednesday in a shopping center's dead and then it's wednesday it's wednesday thursday no thursday friday saturday sunday it sort of builds a, to a crescendo and then monday bank you, you won't see a person monday tuesday yeah it's a lot of work but I think in the short term, yeah, it's great. But for the long term, oh, it's, it's very wearing. And how do you measure success? What what would your expectation of success be having that shopping oh, centre? You being an ex-factory man would know that the only success that you idiots work on is how many cars you sell. That's the million dollar question because exactly as OEMs, we expect you to have a shopping centre and it's going to sell X amount of cars per week. It doesn't. It doesn't tell you. It, it plants the seed for people to look at cars and consider cars does it sell it, it does sell some and for the people the small percentage of people are in the market at that time but really were they going to come here anyway probably may have you know you you might have a car there and yeah i have sold cars but you know probably they came here they went to high point or you know wherever big supermarket and the car's there and it may have you said oh well we might go back because they've spoken to someone but does it sell more cars no it plants the seed i don't think it sells more cars no so would it be fair to say that it's actually part of the funnel but it's not the final destination for the day? everything you do is part of the funnel you know i think it just does it sway people it might you know if there's a new car that's just come out and you have it in the Shopping centre, great, because no one's seen it. It's not on the road. It's the perfect opportunity to have it there and you will get a lot of people come and look at it because it's new. Everyone wants to look at something new, whether it's a phone or a car or whatever, they want to have a look at it. So yeah, plants to seed. Now that might be good for short term, but it's also good in the long term because oh, I've seen that car, I liked it. I spoke to that guy, he was nice. I did get some information emailed to me about the car. So, oh, well, I'm going to look for a new car in six months. So, yeah, great. I'll, I'll consider that at that time. And as far as getting people to work in your dealerships, something that, uh, from an OEM perspective, uh, OEM track is staff turnover. Because we know with high turnover, usually you get low efficiency, etc. The Element brand and, uh, and your time running the business there. That's because I'm lovely. It's because I'm a nice bloke. <laughs> well, the question is, apart from being just not, not that you're a nice bloke, but how do you attract and retain the quality sales and service people that you have had 
in your business for quite a long time. Like anything, Mark, you're treating people with respect. It's an, you make the workplace a nice place to come to. Certain KPIs that everyone's got to try and fit towards. But, you know, if you're having a crack and you're selling cars and you're having a red hot go and training, I think try and train people up as much as possible when they're here. And that's one good thing OEM people do do is they do offer good training. And now it's online, it's much, much easier to put more people through it rather than having them away for a day. This week we've got people training, I think, three out of the five days because they can. So it's great. So anything, even the apprentices now don't go to school, all their training's done online. So every time I walk in there, there'll be one kid there with the headset on, like you've got John, going through on the screen, doing his training for his, you know, first, second or third year apprentice. So that side of it is a lot better than what it used to be. And um, getting people, you know, for us, it's just a matter of, you know, we're not trying to churn and burn for everyone because I agree with you. I think it's just a waste of time. So, and, you know, you've then got to reintroduce people, start again the training, so I'd rather keep banging away with the people I've got than trying to keep going through them. But if the guy's no good, well, then, yeah, he's got to go. So it's a matter of trying to work out who's good and who's bad. So once you get... But so I tend to hire more older guys. Right? I do have a few young people that are really good, but younger people tend to be a bit, you know, if it's too hard, they won't do it. How do you teach them the... children in that bracket too, by the way. So. <laughs> and how, how do you, how do you uh, dip them in and then immerse them in the Alamance way? Oh, no, look, I think you try and buddy them up with someone. That's the easiest way to do it. So, you know, if you, you're not just chucked into the deep end, you really say, right, oh, Johnny, 25 or whatever, he's probably had some sales experience selling computers or furniture or whatever. Uh, and then you're going to sit him down with a more experienced guy and say, all right, stick with Anthony for the next couple of weeks and he'll tell you. And, you know, when the customer comes in, oh, this guy's new, he's just learning. Do you mind if he sits with me and goes through the process? And 90% of customers will go, yeah, no problem at all. You can sit here and listen to how it's done. Uh, you know, I'm thinking if you throw them a few deals, um, as I do, the deals I do, um, to get them to know how the paperwork is, because the paperwork side of it's quite strenuous and big roads and, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that has to be put into the, the deal pack which and uh, for tax, uh, audit, you know, OEM audit, Vic Road. So if you throw him a few deals without the customer there, he can then sit there and put it in the computer so he's not under the pressure of having a bloke sitting in front of him trying to work it in, the, in five minutes. He can do it in half an hour or take an hour, walk over, oh, what do I do here, how do I do that, and take his time. Philip, in terms of, are there any particular actions you do from a dealership point of view to create credibility and trust with your customers? Well, again, socially, you know, you've still got to, with um, Google reviews and all that, you know, you can't not do the right thing. You've got to be uh, looking after people because the first thing they say is, oh, I'll give you a bad review, 100%. And even on the weekend, I got a bad review for the for the store uh, online. So I typed in the message, put my, my name and my, ring me. And fun, he did ring uh, on Saturday afternoon and I had a conversation with him about the bad experience he had and tried to sort it out the best I could. So you're always just trying to, um, and I suppose that's the difference, they're dealing with me. So, you know, I'm trying to, I, I generally fix it. But I think that you're not trying to, and you're not selling poor quality cars, especially used cars. We're not dealing in, you know, five or six or $4,000 cars. And that's, there is a lot of stress in, in that bracket uh, because, you know, a good push bike costs four or five thousand bucks. So when you're dealing in a car that's done three hundred thousand, well, this thing's going to go wrong with it. And Phil, question around: You mentioned the the OEMs because uh, OEMs are a big part of your business. You've got a, a number of uh, OEM, OEM brands that you, that you look after. So can you understand what? makes a good relationship with an OEM from a dealer perspective? One that doesn't tell me what to do, who thinks they know more than I do, which they don't. And what would be an example of the sort of things that they would uh, ask you or, or direct you? Anything that you told me. <laughs> uh, so apart from anything that I've told you. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, look, they tend to ask the bleedingly obvious. And I suppose after a while, uh, <clears throat> at the moment, I had a call this morning from uh, an OEM asking me uh, what marketing am I doing? And I don't know about you, and I say to them, you're in Melbourne, aren't you? And they go, yeah, yeah. And I go, you read the paper? I go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, well, why don't you come out and see me and we'll talk about it. Oh, I'm not allowed to. Oh, why is that? Oh, because we're in stage four lockdown. So then why am I advertising? Because no one can come here. 
So why ask me? This is, it's just more of a why? You know we're in stage four lockdown. You know people can't come to us. So why are you asking me for a marketing plan? We're technically shut. So it, it, it just, those sorts of things really irritate me because I think to myself, well, really, do you know what's happening or do you care? And the fact is that you can ring me. A lot of dealerships you ring at the moment don't even answer the phone. They're ringing me saying, what are you doing? And I go, well, what do you reckon I'm doing? I'm not doing anything. If I am, it's a very limited thing just to tick it over to do a bit of online stuff. But you're on car sales, you know, there's all the cars are still on there. Well, not all the cars, but all the used cars are on there. So you're trying to do a few. But those are the sort of things that I do find a bit irritating when they're, they're not really thinking, well, hang on a second, we don't care. We still want you to sell cars. Well, you know, so that's the sort of thing. But I do find the other thing is that they tend to drill down very, they want more information and more information to the point where, they, I'm sure that no one could possibly go through it or read it because there's just so much. I think in the General Motors one we were doing, we were sending off reams of stuff and we found out that actually no one was actually looking at it. They just wanted the report to get us to do it. I think it, 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 they do try to overcomplicate it. The car business is not that difficult. They're just cars. They don't get people around. You need to get them serviced. You still need to look after them. But, you know, I, I think they do try and overcomplicate it. And as it gets bigger it does become, tend to become very complicated. And General Motors became so complicated it imploded on itself. So what would, if you were like a clean sheet of paper, what would be the ideal OEM relationship or support from a dealer to, to OEM? What, what would well, you expect? I'll, I'll give you an example of an ideal one at the moment. I've got a small brand that I have. Uh, it's based in Sydney. I have one, one rep that does the whole of Victoria. If I've got a problem that I need a car, I'll ring him. I've got a, I do send him a report each week on how many cars we sell and how many people come in. And that's about it. Uh, they send me the, the um, advertising assets and, you know, I do what I need to do uh, with that to try and sell the cars and everyone's happy. So it works a treat. But again, you know, we've, we've been selling 10 or 15 a month and making good quit out of them. But again, once you start overcomplicating it, it does become tedious, but it also, it affects how many you sell. So for instance, you know, we can't sell, we're not allowed to advertise a lot of the new cars on the net. Now, there's advantages to that and there's disadvantages to that. The advantage is if it's a new car, and I've got no issue with new cars not being on there, but if the car's six months or 12 months old, it should be on because it's one thing an OEM doesn't work out. You know, old stock is dead stock and you've got to get rid of it. You know, you don't want to have the old model in the front of the yard and the new model at the back of the yard because you've still got too many of the old model there. The old model should be on the net and see you later. Mitsubishi do it. As soon as a new model comes out, all the old models are on the net and get rid of them because they want the new cars out the front, not the new cars out the back. But if in terms of your relationship with the different OEMs, do you find some take up a lot more time than others and more demanding or is it? Yeah, no, no. Some do because they want more reporting they want to uh, speak to you more often. Um, you know, I've banned uh, people from coming here on, say, right, you can come here once a month and that's it. Uh, oh, well, we want to come every week. I said, no, you can't come. You know, I can't have people uh, offline for two or three hours because you want to go through some myriad of reports. It's not happening. So you can come once a month and that's it. You work out a day and you're not coming to see me. You can speak to the sales manager and um, that's it. One, one of them, I don't talk to them. They have to go through another person. Now, uh, we talk about retail offers and, and moving stock, etc. What retail offers do you see work best? You know, is it driveway pricing? Is it finance campaigns? Okay, you know, there's a typical OEM week? question. Is it driveway pricing? Of course it is, you idiot. That's what it has to be. <laughs> so drive away is where it's all at. Well, it's the law. So you have to quote drive away pricing. You can't not quote it. You know, okay. even if you have a finance offer, you still have to have the drive away price there plus the finance offer. Yeah, drive away always works. Value add always works. Like, you know, Mitsubishi doing seven year warranty with three years free service. That's always good. Nissan are doing one with um, a finance offer. Um, and as, if you take the Nissan finance, you get additional things like three years free servicing or a subvented uh, interest rate. So that always works. So um, keeping it simple is the best. If you're overcomplicating it, like we'll pay your GST and all that, forget it. It's too hard. No one can get their head around it. it you know, again, you'd never see now was twenty nine nine ninety now twenty four nine ninety with a big discount. You don't see that anymore because it wrecks the brand and wrecks the car. 
So it tends to be, right, it's twenty nine nine ninety, 90 and you get seven-year warranty and three-year free service and subvented rate and all that. You'll never see, you don't see any more was twenty nine nine ninety now. Say $5,000, it's now twenty four nine ninety. They, they don't do it anymore. Over a period of time, it just wrecks, wrecks the car. So would it be fair to say, key takeaway here, if you keep it simple, product and price of yep. what it is, how much? Yep. So that driveway price doesn't have to be the cheapest driveway price, no. but it's have a price, but then have the value add. Value add to the way to go, except petrol. Don't do petrol. Petrol never works. So fuel offers do not work. Same as um, we're going to put you in, buy a car and you'll go in the drawer for a house or uh, $10,000 cash. That never works either because everyone thinks they're never going to win. So, so free service, that's that's a, a strong value add? Oh, yeah, really good. But because people know, you know, if I can buy a car and they don't have to service it for three to four years, well, yeah, well, you know, their costs are nil. So all they got to do is put petrol in it and that's it. So for them, it's a no-brainer. So Philip, with more people working from home now, do you think there's any changes from a digital perspective and how they research cars and how they're buying online? I think they've just got more, they've got, they've more, got more time, John, because they haven't got anyone looking over their shoulder at work. You know, they're at home. So yeah, I think our, um, our amount of traffic that's coming to the websites has increased over this period because they've got more time to be doing it, whether you know it's in the morning or at lunchtime or whenever, they're, if they're sitting at home, uh, they're online. Uh, but yeah, I think they've got a bit more time to start looking at, especially option-wise. You can tell when a person rings and he wants this, 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 and this. And I go, well, you've looked at the website. And he goes, yeah, because he knows exactly what he wants. They even some of them send me the part number. Amazing. Uh, and some people, for some options, I've had to look them up because I've never heard of them. And what further changes do you see in the digital space? Because given, given you're a digital pioneer, so we're at this stitch situation where you're putting cars up on hoists and showing underneath, mm. you're, you're responding, you're doing live streaming, live chats, etc. Where do you see, or what, what further changes do you see? What's, what's the next phase? Just more video. You'll have the, at the moment, you know, you've got pictures of the car. So you might have 25 or 30 pictures. But not everyone's doing video. Uh, some people do, but do more walk around video of the car. So you've got a bit more live interaction, if you like, of looking at it rather than just looking at a photo. So you can actually see the car as I'm walking around. So we do quite a lot of video, which I think helps, you know, gives you an advantage, if you want to call it that, over somebody else who's just got 10 shots. You know, we usually do 20 or 30, but you've got a live video that might go for, I think on um, Autogate uh, car sales, you can do it for one minute. But on our own site, we might have them for two or three minutes. So I think that's probably one of the next things that are going to be uh, got a lot more video. I think the photos will die out and the whole thing will just be video. Do you think the role of the salesperson is going to change? Because you're seeing a lot of research happening online. So by the time the customer comes, he just about knows what he wants. I think that's been happening for you know the last four or five years, John. Mm-hmm. So the customer knows that you know I work on really nearly one in two people that come in here ready to buy a car, we've just got to do the right job and try and sell it to them. But they've already made up their mind that they want to buy that car if they're coming in here. Getting back to OEMs, we, uh, we're always guilty of doing that have road upgrade. to the sale. So uh, no, no doubt your OEMs would be asking you questions around test drives and showroom display, etc. Given the digital world, how important now is the showroom display or is that less important or more important? Yeah, oh, it's becoming less important. You know, the test drive is important. So, you know, you probably got more cars outside than inside. It looks nice, I suppose, you know, having cars on the floor and all that. But again, you know, if you've got, you know, Kia or Nissan, you know, you've got quite a number of models. So like in a Navara, there's you know, 45 models. So really, you're going to have one car on the floor. Well, you know, if that's the particular car guy walks in to buy, it's going to be pretty rare because you've got so many different models and variants. It's really more about, as you say, he's already done all his due diligence and knows what he wants and he wants a price. He might come in just to get a physical size of the car. 90% of the time, a guy will drive a car that all, the only thing is the engine and the gearbox. The rest of the car are completely different, might be a completely different model. But I don't have what he wants, but I say, right, this is a car. It's got the same motor and gearbox. So jump in that and go for a drive in it. Uh, yes, it hasn't got leather and yes, it, or it may have, but you'll get the, the idea of how it drives. Yeah. But they're coming less and less. The new car department is getting less and less. That's- so test drive still is the critical piece. And that's why if they come in for a test drive, they're well and truly down that funnel. Would it be fair yeah. to say? 
Yeah, if you're down to test, test drive, um, you are getting down to tin tacks of, uh, you know, you might say you might have five cars that you want to look at, then you'll whittle it down to, say, three, then you'll go for a test drive in those three and whittle it down to two and then make your decision out of the two. You know, it just might be the fact that one's a Japanese car, one's a Korean car, one's built in Europe. They do drive differently and they sound different depending on, you know, what country they come from, noise, engine noise, road noise. A Japanese car tends to have more road noise. European cars quieter on the road. Korean cars different to a Japanese car. Going back to F and I, you mentioned the changes in the Act. Has there been any specific actions you've taken to address that? No, you're really just trying to, um, you know, help the person. We've sent people away for six months, for instance. You can't get a, a loan now, but because of A, B, and C, for the next six months, fix A, B, and C. Stop getting Uber Eats. Stop taking, you know, Uber or DD or rides or doing this or doing that, because that is what is coming up, and they're adding that into your credit worthiness and taking that off. Stop punting on sports bet and taking it out of your credit card because they don't like that. They're the sort of things that you're educating those people to stop doing to fix their credit application over a period of six to 12 months and then they come back oh yep yeah, done all that great bang you've got the loan so it, 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 you're just trying to you know you turn into a financial planner for people and philip you've always been a leader not only just in digital space but you've always been a leader in the fleet space and yeah. yet the fleet is just under 50 percent of the total australian market uh, how do you see that playing out and are you still active in the fleet space the definition of fleet these days is pretty rubbery you know you've got Novated, the Novated side's now massive with all the different Novated companies and they're classed as fleet. So where, well, 10 or years ago, they weren't, whereas now they are. But when you get into it, it is amazing the amount of cars that are sold in that space. Technically, should be retail, but are actually, uh, you know, big fleet customers. Uh, am I active in fleet? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm still open. I'm still delivering police cars. I've got Australia Post. Uh, we're busy at the moment. Yeah. And as far as the your business model, you, you've got your dedicated team that focuses on that. I know you've uh, you've got some amazing talent in in your in your business uh, when it comes to the fleet space. Obviously, it starts with yourself and the, and your leadership there. How that strategy is clearly articulated through the team. Yeah, well, you know, like I do all the quotes. You know, I'm doing. 100, 150 quotes a week myself, which is all online and all that sort of stuff. But I think it, you know, you're trying to lead by example. And then I've got a number of people in different brands that look after those customers and eventually they start doing some quotes for them or they ring back and a guy rang back the other day and said, oh, you know, you've given us 10 Serratos, I need another 10. So then can you do them at the same price? So it's pretty easy. Just a matter of the biggest issue is the car's clean. It's got all the accessories fitted to it and it gets delivered on time. It is amazing. People may leave me for some reason price and they come back and go, we've come back to you because, you know, you do it properly. In terms of used cars, you mentioned that's a very important part of your business. Besides the vehicles you trade in, do you purchase vehicles from a number of other sources? We're always trying to. Unfortunately, at the moment, like, at the, you know, the minute the prices are very high. So um, if anything, you're probably having a, a crack at trying to trade more cars in rather than buy more cars. So you'd rather sell a new car and trade one in rather than just trying to buy cars, you know, from an auction or uh, from wherever. But yeah, we do buy them, yeah. You, you have to if you want to try and keep your stock up. Especially if the used, if the new cars drop off, you can you know run out of used cars. Well, not run out, but get to a lot point where it starts to look a bit empty. Do you use your your fleet business to generate used car stock? Absolutely. Yeah. You always uh, you know even with the Novated stuff, um, they tend to trade in. Now a lot of these cars go back to the Novated company and then they put them through the auction. So I'm always at them saying, can I buy the car? Can I buy the car? How much do you want for the car? So that started to um, to work a bit. So yeah, we are. Picking up a bit more stock that way as well. Just and, and as far as government vehicles, are they still good news as a used car or, or you're finding yeah, they, are, they, all, they all go through the auction? You, you can't you bug it there, so yeah, yeah 100%. And they, th their uh, suite of cars now has expanded not just from Australian built cars to cops drive BMWs, um, you know, Kias, we sell Kias into them, you know, the whole range of cars has expanded a lot, which is great because they're, you know, probably better used cars than a white Commodore V6 Amiga. In terms of used cars, is there any particular best practice for marketing used cars? No, oh, just car sales. You know, look, if you if you stuck with car sales, there is a few things on Google I do in terms of 
custom search engine stuff that you can do on specific cars. So it's a way you actually put in Google how you search the car and it hopefully it'll match up with a car. So you're marketing one, one thing. So that person can then, if he's, look, I've got a Ford Falcon in front of me. So if he's looking for a Ford Falcon Echo Boost, then my that one car will come up that he might then click through to my website instead of going on to car sales. And uh, you mentioned before about having an online parts store. Yeah. Uh, so you're pretty, obviously, very active in the in the parts space. Yeah. Uh, how, do you do a lot of trade or is it mainly private that you're doing through the online store? No, I do a lot of trade. Trade's um, interesting, dealing with uh, part panel beaters. And you tend to, over the years, stick with people that you know are going to pay because, you know, there's fair, fairly slim margins in it and in the trade side of it. You need to be careful who you deal with. And from a, a service perspective, what trends are you seeing in, uh, in service? No, no, most people these days are still, because a lot of it's cap price, you know, a lot of people are coming back to car, yard, or car dealers for service, whereas they used to go to, and some people do go to backyarder guys, we call them, if you want to, uh, or service stations or stuff like that. But a lot of the time they'll get burnt or the car won't feel right. You know, the, the engines these days are very particular in what oil you put in them, not just the grade of oil, but even the make. They're designed for only one particular type. So if you stick the mineral oil in it, for instance, it won't drive the same. And then they'll come, I've had many calls where people saying, oh, if I just had it serviced and it, it's not running right, it seems sluggish and all that. And so where'd you get it done? Oh, I got it done at ABC Motors or, you know, a little yard guy. I go, well, he's probably put the wrong oil in it. And they go, oh, that can't make the difference. I said, it does. I said, tell you what, I'll put oil in it. And if you don't think it changes the difference, I'll give you your money back. So they come and we just change the oil and the guy will get to the end of the street and ring me and go, it's like a different car. That's how fickle these new engines are, just from putting the correct oil in it to putting a mineral-based oil, because all our oils now are full synthetic, can change the car markedly in our drives. Yeah, it's amazing there's such a difference in disparity between different oils in it. It's I am quite fascinating. Yeah, I'm a mate, especially in the diesel motors. Yeah. makes a huge difference. So in terms of retention, what is this? You know, the average age for a retail customer to change their vehicle over is eight years. Is there anything particularly you do to try and retain? Because it's a very long period to try and keep contact with a customer. Yeah, it, it basically just trying to, um, it's really through service department. So, you know, we do a lot of service reminders and continually doing that, you know, over the years, just trying to get them back into service. So when they come into service, they'll stay hopefully and walk around and look at a new car and have a chat to somebody. And hopefully they've dealt with the same person uh, that is still here, which I think is another reason why staff retention is important that, uh, you know, in three years or four years time or five years time, the same bloke you sold the car to four or five years ago is the same bloke that you're talking to. So, oh, g'day, John. Hey, how are you going, Anthony? You know, you're still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Yes, I think that's such an important point, the continuity of staff and the value that brings. Absolutely. It's the underlying value that you you don't really realise until, you know, four or five years into it when they come back and buy the same another car off the same bloke. That, that That's priceless. Can't buy that. Yeah, because I think part of the saying is people buy from people, not from buildings or dealerships. I recall a very wise man said that. Yeah, I heard it from a very wise man, Mark. And, and Phil, so what do you see, because you've been around a couple of years, uh, like myself with this industry. So as far as the customers that leave the franchise network, service uh, programs we talked about are a good way of retain, retaining them in the franchise. Warranties, when I first started, were 12 month, 20,000 K. So are the extended warranties and these uh, serve cap price service programs retaining the customers uh, and what other initiatives are there to, to keep them coming back? Hey, well, customers forget. You could have a three-year free servicing and a person will forget that he's got it and then go and get it serviced somewhere else because he's forgotten. So that's why service reminders are really important just to jolt people's memory because people forget. And I think if you look at the percentages, only 65% of people come back to get their free service. 35% of people go somewhere else and pay for it. What surprises me is many years ago, I'm talking 20, 30 years ago, customers would leave because the service wasn't affordable. But I think that's all changed. And with these extended warranty service contracts, cap price servicing. I think the franchise dealers as competitive now as he's ever been and customers still leaving. Do you think there's, is that just because customers don't realize the value they're getting from the franchise dealer? Yeah, they do. They just think that, you know, it's expensive. And yeah. I think um, even in the last four or five years, it's really come down to the fact that 
dealers aren't ex aren't expensive or aren't as expensive. Yes, they could have been, but now they're not. A lot of people now ring up and go, oh, "How much is timing chain for this?" And I they might tell them a price, and they go back to a local service station, and it's basically the same. So they go, well, hang on, I might as well go with the dealer. I'm going to get a factory warranty with the part. Place is a bit nicer. They're going to lend me a car, la da 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 So we do get a lot more older cars coming back into the service department. And we get a lot more calls from people asking about pricing. And they go, oh, that's amazing, because you're about the same price or slightly cheaper than my, my, my local mechanic. And we go, well, because we're trying to compete with your local mechanic. Um, yeah, I think it's, it has improved a lot over the last, uh, since the extended warranties came in. What, three, when did three year warranty come in, Mark? About 10 years ago, 12 years ago? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, Holden brought out a three year, 100,000 K warranties back in, believe it, 1992. There you go. So uh, yeah, up until then, it was 12 months, 20 thousand. Uh, and then your powertrain warranty was uh, three years, and now five years is the standard. There's actually some con a debate and conjecture around seven year warranty we were talking to potentiate who do the new car buyer survey and, and we've got some interesting data on retentions and john and i actually had a, a discussion before we had that particular episode as to how long we thought the average customer keeps their car for and as an oem you're always thinking well they keep them for three years and they turn them over and i thought i'll be a bit more uh, out there and I went, I said, oh, I'll be five years because now warranties are five years. Uh, it was interesting that Potentiate said it's eight years is the average and fleets are shorter because they've got a structured changeover process mm -hmm. because if the money has a finite time. So uh, it sort of surprises that the customers actually retain their cars. And your point, Philip, is a very interesting one when you're talking about having the same person that sold them the car there in five years' time to talk to them and remind them. And I think the reminder point you makes a really strong one because, you know, I've been guilty of putting together service, uh, free service campaigns uh, and provisioning all this money off to pay for these free services that no one ends up claiming. Which is just amazing, really, when you think about it. 60% of the people take it and 40% don't. They've got to go somewhere. They have to get the car service, otherwise it'll break down. Activities around that, that oil that you say as well, that there is risk for those customers going outside of the franchise dealer network. No, oh, absolutely. And a lot of, you know, you're always competing against, you know, certain other brands that say, oh, no, bring it to us and you'll still get a manufacturer's warranty and all that sort of stuff. Well, not if you've got the wrong oil in it, mate. You won't. And not if they don't do the logbook service, uh, you know, they forgot they haven't, it's, oh, but I'd say it's half the price. It's half the price because they don't do half the work. They're not doing the tappet adjustment. They're not changing the diff oil. Then eventually something goes wrong and the diff blows up in it, which has happened a year ago. The bloke rings me and he goes, well, it's not covered under warranty. I go, no, because you've never changed the oil. Oh, but I've been taking it to the local mechanic and he tells me he did. Well, I'm telling you he hasn't because it, it looks like treacle. It doesn't look like oil. It's 5,000 bucks for a new, for new diff. Sorry, but that's not my decision. And, you know, people think I've got little gremlins out the back making the cars. I'm only the middle man. I have to actually ask somebody else if it's okay, like him, Mark. Then he has to make the decision and I have to break the news to the person. So I think that's why we're trying to be more competitive um, and keep banging on about the same thing. And some people over the time, people do start to believe that you are you are doing the right thing, you are competitive and you are using genuine parts and you are using the right oil and it does work because your car doesn't break down and you get better fuel economy and all those sorts of things. And you know, you don't need to take it to a mechanic a mechanical workshop. And no problem, by all means. You know, if it's an older car, be my guest. Take it to them. But the newer stuff. You've got to be careful. But it makes a good point to make sure the customer is comparing apples with apples when he compares the price from a franchise dealer to someone else. Are they using the right oil? Have they done the full service? Everything involved, you know, so I think it's... A you know, that's important because some of these... On some of the labour charges that we get in cap price, the, the actual labour charge might be $80. That's all we're making. But the rest of it is the oil the filter, uh, some of the oils in these cars cost $100. The, the labour component of it is not a lot. It's all the stuff that you buy to put in it is expensive. And especially the right quality, as you oh, mentioned yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. Well, we use full synthetic oil on every car. Like It's not yeah. cheap. Like I could be buying crappy mineral stuff, but it's no good. It won't work. So in your workshops, do you then have different oils for each of your different brands? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that, that complexity, how do you manage that complexity that each brand does things differently? Well, every, see, we've got different workshops, so we don't have one workshop. So, we get, you know, we've got five workshops. So 
and each one you branded to Nissan, Mitsubishi or Holden or Kia or whatever. So that's, it's easy because you've got different lines. So, okay, this is going to be the Nissan shop or that line's the Nissan oil and that line's the Mitsubishi oil, for instance. So it's not too bad. Uh, if you're in the one, one workshop, yeah, I think it would be tough. If you had six brands in one workshop, I don't know how you'd do it. You'd have to, you'd be walking around with little buckets of oil. You'd have to go up and tap it in and then pour it in, which is a real pain in the neck. It makes a mess and you've got oil everywhere. So we use the guns, just pull them down, dial it up, and it, it makes it a lot easier and a lot cleaner. Okay, Philip, thanks very much. I think there's been a really good discussion. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to see the good relationship between OEM and dealers coming out. <laughs> is it true that you bought a, a Range Rover for your 50th? I did, yeah. Well, back when um, cars, you know, the Bluetooth was, didn't really work that well. One Christmas, I got fined uh, four times in three weeks for talking on the phone. That was 12 points, so then I was out. And I think I already had one point, so I had to do the 12 months one point thing. I thought, I've got to do something, otherwise... I'm going to lose my license for sure. And, you know, years ago when you talk on the phone, if you saw a copy, you just sort of put the phone down and then, you know, you'd, before, you'd drive past and you pick it back up. One day I'm driving down Beach Road and we're just full of cars driving as it used to be before COVID hit. Anyway, I'm looking behind me and I can see this bloke in a Falcon, about 20 cars behind me, his lights flashing. Thinking, oh, shit, we better all move over. Everyone slowly moves over and he gets up to me. So I sort of move over and he moves over with me. I go, oh, he's pointing. Anyway, I pull over and I said, yeah, how can I help you? He said, you're talking on the phone. I said, no. Nah. He goes, yeah, I was driving the other way and saw you on the phone, so I had to do a U-E and come back and get you. I said, you're kidding. Me. <laughs> you had to do a U-turn, come back and pull all these cars over just so you could get to me because I was talking on the phone. He said, yeah. I said, man, you're a prick. Oh, uh, yeah, so I ended up, had to buy a car. Uh, so I bought a, I actually bought a Range Rover because I never had one and always liked them. So I bought one and drove it for a couple of years just so I can get my points back. See, you're, there's always a need. It always comes from a need. Which I is had a Hummer too. I used to have a Hummer H2. I imported one of those and drove that for uh, 12 months. That was pretty cool. The Bluetooth would have been good on that. Oh, well, back then, I don't think no one cared about it. Back then, that was a long time. That's when you could talk on the phone. Well, Phil, anything uh, else you want to cover off with us? Anything else that we haven't asked? Like anything, it's tough at the moment. You're just trying to do the best you can, really. You know, um, Luckily, we've got the fleet stuff, which is working pretty well. So, um, And we're open for emergency breakdowns and the cops. So we get a lot of police cars in for service and breakdowns. They're in accidents on the weekend. So they're all in here getting new tyres and wheels put on them, you know, crashing into things. So, um, yeah, there's always, uh, you know, people get towed, engines blow up. Like on a, every Monday, there'd be seven or eight cars of different brands here on a tow truck getting dropped off. So there's always, you know, something to do. And I think it's a good opportunity at this time, if you are open, that, you know, you are getting people are coming, franchises or fleet companies are ringing saying, oh, you're the only one open. Can I, I've got a breakdown. Can I send it to you? Because this, my normal deal is not open. I'll start using you. So, you know, we've picked up quite a bit in the journey. So, so are all your sites open? So Bacchus, uh, yeah, Bacchus is in stage three because um, they're outside the lockdown. So they've always been open and he's really picked up a lot of work. Uh, they're supposed to be going to stage two tomorrow. So, um, yeah, so that's where the local paper ad's going in next week. And, and Melton and uh, and Footscray? The, those yeah, those are... Melton's just running the one workshop, but in Footscray I've got both workshops going. So that's good. I've got to commend you on your, your initiatives early in the COVID as far as your, your, your leading position on telling the story that auto is open. Yeah, and I think that's it. that was important at the time because, you know, I think everyone was a bit unsure, couldn't get your car service, couldn't you... And the government was saying, oh, you can only do this, this and this. That wasn't actually true. Um, you know, you could get your car service. You could go and buy furniture. And just that VACC had a bit of money that we could uh, actually do some proper advertising. And it, I think it helped. People could still have a normal life. Look, whatever happened, happened. Whether it was uh, the government's fault or just it just got out of control. It is what it is. So we've just got to get back to where uh, I think it was 42 cases today. So hopefully, in, you know, in the next couple of weeks, we'll get down to 20. And, you know, as I say, the country should be in stage two by tomorrow. So, yeah, look, it's, it's on the right way. But this, the go I listened to the government handout package. I think that was Sunday that they talked about it. For the car business, we're not, as a, as a dealer group, <coughs> The amount of money that was handed to us is it wouldn't last us till lunchtime. Uh, so job, job keeper for technicians, job keeper for uh, oh for the federal government stuff, yeah, hundred percent. That's been fantastic. 
and kept everybody going. If you didn't have that, well, the unemployment rate would be 30%, not 10. But uh, yeah, for the state, the state level stuff I'm talking about, the amount of money that was offered to companies of a reasonable size is, you know, forget about it. Well, Phil, keen to summarise uh, what we've covered off today. And thank you for a very detailed uh, conversation around your dealership business and, and, the, and the very complex business that you have because we've covered quite a fair area. Uh, the big picture we're talking about, we talked about your challenges that you're facing and, and you still highlight that F&I is one of the biggest challenges, apart from obviously the, the elephant in the room, which is COVID. COVID we know will pass, but the F&I changes seem to be really biting and they have bitten for basically two years. So, and it's interesting that you're taking those initiatives to educate those people that are now bronze uh, and silver uh, category uh, finance customers where they, you know, they, they actually are worse off now than they were before. But when we talk about how do you attract and retain your quality sales people and service people, this is where the point of difference comes for the Alamance business where your mantra of treating them with respect and also training them. And I really like the point you raised about you have that buddy system where the new person gets inducted and, and has that process of not just being thrown in the deep end, but they actually get to learn because that then comes back in what you said very a lot later in the conversation around that whole service customers coming in and keeping them coming back because if they're seeing someone that they've dealt with years ago still there that trust bit is there and they feel very much at home yeah half the job's done. comfortable to then retain uh, to buy a car from so you've got a very strong retention policy with your customers but it actually starts with your people, your salespeople and your service people, which is a credit to the strategies and structures that you put in place. And respect's a big part of that. We, you talked about the branding and you've always been an innovator in the digital space. So it's that story and the values of what the Alamance business stands for and the medium that you use and Facebook and Google are your two main mediums that you use. You do a little bit on Instagram. You use car sales for your used car business because that's the transactional bit. But you've also done some adopting and you're still developing further actions around this live streaming. And you mentioned video is a bigger part of your digital journey and what you've, the evidence by what you're doing now in these COVID times, where you're even putting cars up on the hoist and showing people the underneath of the car. So they're getting a better experience and more intimate experience digitally with the stuff that you're doing. So once again, an innovator and leader in the digital space, but you're taking it to that next level. And, and that's on the retail side. And when we talked about retail offers and you said, right, so how do you, what works best? And you confidently said that driveway is important. So you have to have a driveway price because you need to know what the product is and what the price is, but yeah. you don't necessarily need to discount the, uh, the guts out of it. What you've mentioned is you have that driveway price, but then that's the value adds. And you mentioned the finance offers as a value add, but you still need to have a price in there. You can't just have a finance offer. You need to have, uh, like you can do the extended warranty and the other add-on bits as well and the free service to get people back in for re that retention. You mentioned something very important that I, I think uh, is often overlooked from an OEM perspective is those reminders. If you have a free service campaign, you've got to have a reminder because you're saying the 60% of people, uh, only 60% come back. So you lose 40% that have a free service, but they're paying for it somewhere else. Yeah, so that has to be done. So, and your, your initiatives there around those reminders are critical. And then you also talked about, that's the retail side, but fleet is so critical because that's a baseline volume and you've, you're ahead of the game, understanding the novated space and how important that is, because that's also a source of, of quality, diverse used cars. And you also talked about the need to do the other fleet business, which is like the government stuff and the other uh, FMO stuff. Stuff, where you provide good after sales service. You talked about these police cars that have been damaged. Who do they go to? You're the go-to person. You also mentioned that you don't necessarily have to be the cheapest all the time. You might, you'll have some customers that may go away because of yeah. a, a $10 or less price over here, but they come back to you yeah. because you deliver their cars to them when they need them in the good in the right condition so that's that really strength that you've got from a fleet perspective and having good people through your business and even yourself being involved in it i think is a critical piece so you've got your finger on the pulse in all areas you talked about used cars and just sourcing them and and there are challenges from the from the auction space but you still play you still look to look for value and because you know those f and i customers that can't buy new are going to be buying lower car used yeah. So that's a really big, important part. And you talked about the need to have that, the Google words for that Falcon 
the EcoBoost one that you've got out the front. Uh, and then you talked about the importance of parts. And when you do trade parts, you really got to be careful around the organisations that need to make sure they pay on time. And you've got your online parts store, which is a very critical piece that is actually getting a lot of traction now, which is uh, great news because that back end is so important. And then there's that service side of things, those service reminders and making sure that you can highlight the value that you provide in service because there are risks in going outside to organisations that don't have the training that your staff are doing. You mentioned that the training that they're doing online, they don't have to go away to spend days away. They can do it online in between uh, other jobs that they're doing so that they can be best skilled, provide good service and make sure they're putting the right oil in because putting the wrong oil is such a critical piece. Yeah, it is so you've, uh, when you look at a, a, the complete picture and we thank you for coming on the show because you have your finger on, so, on all the pulses of all those critical elements of the business. And you're doing it with, you talked about the OEM relationships with multiple brands. So some brands are a bit more, get more involved. Others will leave it to you. When you, you one thing I highlighted that you said here is, and I'll put big text and, and highlighter on it is keeping it simple because yeah. you're across all parts of your business and you'll, you look to a business partner that keeps it simple, but still gives you that support. When, no, that's uh, what when you're looking at. You're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You just need a bit of help every now and again. It's a bit like a president of a football club. You know, he does a great job, but he's just there in the background and he's not out the front broken his wares all the whole time. Like, and, but he's helping the coach uh, as much as he can. And that's what an OEM should be. You know, he's there, he's supplying the product to the person, but letting that person run his business the way he wants it, not the one, not running it the way that they think he should run it and uh, each to their own. But very good, Mark. Well done. Is that a pass, Philip? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Phil, thanks very much. It's been a really fascinating talk. And it's really great to talk to people who really understand the business and got great experience in that because you learn all the time. And today has been another learning experience for me. So thanks very much. That's all right. Pleasure. Nice to uh, see you. Mark, and nice to meet you, John. Well, thank, thank you me. once again. In regards to the, uh, the family. I will. Thanks for listening today. Hopefully you've got as much out of that fantastic interview with Philip Manns as we did. Uh, as you can see, Philip is a, he's a character and he's a colourful dealer in the, uh, the Melbourne and the Australian dealer landscape. If you need any more information on today's episode or would like any information on any other episode or you have a topic that you'd like us to cover, please send a message via LinkedIn to John Sinclair or myself, Mark Palavestra. If you like the show, please ensure you subscribe to our channel uh, and like us uh, on, the, uh, on YouTube, but also like us on LinkedIn and reach out. And we look forward to seeing you at our next episode. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we look forward to speaking to you next week.